Hello and welcome to another episode of the Odd Lots podcast. I'm Joe Weisenthal. And I'm Tracy Alloway. Tracy, remember in like the 2000s or like the financial crisis and everyone- I can barely remember <laughs> last year, but okay. go on. And everyone said, oh, it's such a tragedy. People could have been curing cancer, but then they, they were spending their time coming up with like more and more complex derivatives. <laughs> and then I feel like for the 2010s, that morphed to all the smart people could have been curing cancer, but they spent their time getting more ads onto like tiny phone screens and stuff like that. This is the whole like software sucking up the entire economy idea. But yes, I do remember that criticism. There was a lot of thought that went into how to best advertise on the internet. And in fact, I think we had an episode at one point about how the internet was actually powered purely by ads, yeah. right? No, I mean, it more or less seems to be. I mean, I guess people do pay for something, but it also feels like that era both sort of from a macro standpoint and maybe a micro standpoint is coming to a close again again another decade pivot because we have seen a lot of these internet mega companies like meaningfully start to slow growth the business models aren't firing on all cylinders as they once were and then just sort of like tech in general from macro reasons uh seems to be it it, it had better days Right. Interest rates are going up. And so a lot of the valuations of big tech companies are coming down. But also to the business model point, I think this is interesting because initially, you know, we talk about uh, very smart people going to tech firms and venture capital and spending a lot of mental energy there trying to figure out the business model. But to some extent, it feels like the easy gains are kind of behind us, right? It was you create a product, you get everyone on your particular platform or using your product or whatever and then you make a bunch of money. And now it feels like things are changing. I, absolutely. I mean, look at a company like um, Facebook, for example, is just this, you know, they're really having to work for it. Like they're, they're, their model is stressed right now and there's the rise of TikTok and so forth. Every one of these companies, it feels like to some extent, after creating a decade of like, the best money vacuuming up machines that were ever created mm. are now like, they kind of have to really work for it now. Yeah, and come up with, let's say, more creative strategies. And one of the things we've seen recently is something from Apple. Right, and so one of the stories is that Apple has this incredible position in the ecosystem because so many people own an iPhone and they pull out the first thing they interact with is the iPhone to get to the internet. And they have a lot of power over these other companies in terms of, you know, what shows up on that iPhone and how. Right. And again, they're having to be more creative in making money off of those products, right? The iPhone is getting more technologically advanced. You don't have to necessarily buy one every year. Uh, people are holding on to them for longer. So how do you wrest more money out of that particular customer base. Such a tragedy. Companies are having <laughs> trouble wresting more money out of their customer base. What a, what a terrible situation. Anyway, without further ado, I want to talk more about online advertising, this world, the challenges all these companies are facing. We're going to be speaking with our colleague, Mark Bergen. He's a reporter here at Bloomberg, and he is the author of a recently published book, like, comment, subscribe inside YouTube's chaotic rise to world domination. So, Mark, thank you so much for coming on Odd Lots and congratulations on the book. Oh, thanks so much. Thanks so, for having me. So, first of all, like, why a book about YouTube now? Why do we, why'd you do this project? Yeah, YouTube is this uh, kind of a sleeping giant in social media. It's someone described it as like this iceberg that no one ever really talks about as much for, for yeah. a variety of reasons. Uh, I see YouTube as both the past and now future of, of social media. And it was the first company to pay online broadcasters and invented the creator economy. And now we're seeing with TikTok, Instagram, Snapchat, you know, Twitch, you name it, are all moving in this direction. Social media is no longer your friends and family and your acquaintances. It is influencers. Mm. It is celebrity. It is a game built around commerce. Uh, and this is a world that, that YouTube very much created. Should we be telling Odd Lots listeners to like, comment, and subscribe? Other podcasts do that. <laughs> I mean, it's an effective call to action. Okay. All right, everyone, like, comment, and subscribe on Odd Lots uh, wherever yeah. you find it. Okay, but you, uh, well, but we were talking in the intro about mm -hmm. this idea that the sort of like easy gains are over for social media. And it is true. We've seen all these new issues also come up like 
antitrust when it yeah. comes to Facebook and Google, um, content regulation when it comes to YouTube, who should be the arbiters of what's true and what isn't. Are the easy days over for social media? Uh, I think, I mean, YouTube's business has grown tremendously. Uh, and, and part of it was because they really didn't kind of lock into their commercial success until 2014, 2015. Mm. So we only, the only data we have available is beginning in 2017 for their ads business. But 2017, that was around 8 billion. Last year, it was close to 29 billion. Wow. Uh, pretty phenomenal growth. They just took off during the pandemic. Um, when the viewership numbers and we're all stuck at home watching you there are studios Hollywood studios were shut down like youtube became the default media aesthetic and uh a, you know a lot of kids a lot of you know yoga for videos just the hours have just exploded um but that the business has been crippled i think you could make the argument more by apple's changes than by any any regulation thus far all right let's jump right into it so apple they say, oh, we're the defenders of privacy. And now I always get these alerts on my phone. It's like, do you still want to be broadcasting information to that app? It looks like maybe you haven't rethought this or something, which I imagine is not great for those apps when I click no. Yeah, I mean, there were people in, in Google and Facebook, uh, less so at, at Google, but they will gripe privately. Facebook started to do it publicly. Like it, Apple is now building out a, a a search advertising business. They're starting to hire more people. Like they have, this is a, a really savvy move. They've marketed themselves as the privacy first company. They have restricted online cookies on iPhones and like kneecapped uh, a lot of potential digital rivals. I think the one way to, to look at it is, is, you know, this is, they are making the, they are driving this, this force movement towards less behavioral and targeted advertising, the sort of foundation for the internet economy of the last two decades. Uh, the cynical view is that they have found a pretty effective way to build out a competing business to Google yeah. uh, without the world really knowing it. Hmm. Well, OK, so first of all, if you talk to Apple about this, they will say it's about privacy yes. concerns. If you talk to their competitors like YouTube or Facebook, they will probably yes. say this is a revenue grab. How are you thinking about it and what are the sort of like clues or evidence on either side? Yeah, I think Google's a really interesting test case. It has this. Um, frenemy relationship with Apple. They are competitors, certainly in, in obviously in smartphone markets. Uh, Google's kind of gone after them a lot around an iPhone, but in their prime Google's primary business of search advertising, like Apple is a, a extraordinarily convenient partner uh, because for a long time, Apple uh, Google has been the default search engine for Apple. And, and now that it's the subject of a Department of Justice antitrust case, uh, I think this is the chief reason why Facebook meta has been griping very publicly about what Apple's been doing, and you haven't heard a peep from Google. Uh, and in part because their search business is less effective. Like search business, search ads in general are less reliant on the kind of third party cookies. YouTube, however, is is heavily reliant on the fact that they want to like they can serve much better and higher priced ads if they know all the videos that you've watched, all the other websites you visited, you know, all the sort of granularity that this this entire complex machinery of online advertising is built upon. So can we actually take a step back and mm -hmm. can you maybe explain exactly how the market operated before Apple's big switch? Because this is not something that I am entirely familiar with other than, as Joe mentioned, you know, suddenly you get all these notices on your phone saying, yeah. do you want to opt into data tracking? Yeah, I mean, it. it, it is, uh, I think, remarkably similar to sort of financial m markets in its like complexity and opacity, um, like there are effectively like two sided markets right there. There's a buy side and a sell side where you have, you know, publishers that are out there, like have a lot of online real estate. And that's everything from Bloomberg.com and the New York Times to like very popular mobile apps that that uh, and Snapchat, Twitter, right? Like Twitter has real estate. And, and, and then there are a bunch of marketers that want to get in front of consumers. Uh, Google has the machinery on both sides, like they own both sides of the market. Um, and Google has, is the world's biggest digital advertising company. They have been for, for decades now, the sort of primary way that pub online publishers have, have monetized is with Google AdSense. Uh, that basically AdSense is the same exact model on YouTube, just taken over to video. So it is the world's biggest online video advertising service by far. Uh, and effectively is a very easy and increasingly automated system where if I'm a marketer, I'm PNG. PNG spends you know millions of, uh, of dollars and, and billions of dollars in marketing. Uh, I'm going to go to Google and I'm going to kind of give them 
a chunk of money effectively, it goes through a bunch of ad, ad agencies, and then Google's gonna allocate that based on, you know, oh, we're gonna get this to search in front of people whenever they type a, a keyword. We're gonna put this on display to put on the, you know, the Bloomberg's.coms of the world, and we're gonna allocate this to, to video, knowing that we can actually reach in this very hyper-targeted way uh, the consumers we want to reach. Are there speculators who would, might be the equivalent of a hedge fund or a trading desk who will buy ad inventory just on the assumption that they can flip it and sell it for more than what that person was selling for? Uh, I haven't heard of that one. There's certainly like all sorts of middlemen uh, in the industry. And, you know, you, you, there, there were times in, in the era, I'm sure this still happens, but I used to go to all these advertising conferences and, you know, all sorts of ad tech companies that, you know, you, they you asked them what they do and it's just, you don't really understand where they sit in the stack, right? There's just like all sorts of complexities and, and they're programmatic advertising yeah. companies that just do one thing on mobile. And there was Bluetooth advertising was a big hot thing where you could actually like serve an ad to a consumer right when they're in front of the Colgate uh, <laughs> at the aisle. Like this was, I mean, this was, we're moving towards this world and, and certainly before Apple stepped in, of of, a, of incredible like they're geofencing be able to like get your cellular data and know your exact location and push alerts and um i mean this is why it's under so much privacy and antitrust scrutiny uh is because it became quickly invasive uh and, and incredibly unregulated so can you talk to us maybe about like how important data targeting yeah. or targeting of an, uh, an audience actually is because i think we he we hear these things like oh it's it makes it harder for advertisers yeah. if they're not able to track your data like, why is that so important and like can you maybe give us some numbers around how valuable a, a targeted ad is versus an untargeted one i don't even know if untargeted ads exist on the internet oh anymore. yeah I've well and just on on to sort of uh, add on to tracy's question like let's say i go to golf.com yeah. Okay. How, the ads that I get, like how much is it? Oh, I'm, he's on golf.com. He probably wants to mm -hmm. read about golf as opposed to ads that I get that maybe, you know, the last 10 sites I went to is like pets.com or something yeah, like yeah, that. Yeah. And so my, like how valuable is it for golf.com to be able to know that I also like pets? I mean, there, there is all sorts of open and may unsolved questions about the, uh, the, the value and X like, precision of online advertising. The classic example is like you go and you buy a pair of sneakers and then all you see are ads yeah. for the same exact sneakers, like just following you around the internet, right? It's like, I just bought these. Why do you, like the, the world's biggest tech companies that supposedly know a lot about you, like can't solve that hey, problem. You bought one pair of sneakers, yeah, you yeah, must you want, want one. Other one, right? Well, I do, but, but I definitely <laughs> don't need a second uh, stove. Yeah, I, 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 I mean, I think that, that to a certain extent, the, like the, you know, YouTube is a really interesting example in part, like they, they have, they built this very uh, a fantastic targeting model where they can like show an ad to a viewer. You, you mentioned like if you watch a lot of golf channels, right? Like you're if you're an advertiser, you are going to probably want to get in front of that. You know, if you're if you're selling golf gear or clubs, you want to get in front of that person that's watching a lot of YouTube videos. They have this uh, feature, I'm sure, the skippable ad format, which is a major part of their success, was because you know if, if the consumer is actually watching this because they didn't click the skip button. Uh, that's worth a lot more money. And right. if Nike runs an ad that didn't skip, Adidas is going to want to pay more in, in this automated bidding system. And this is why Google search kind of works really well with scarcity too, where it's like they can drive up the, the cost per, per mill or cost per click um, pretty high in these, in these scarce markets. Well, let's go back then to the Apple situation directly. Prior to this policy change, what was an iPhone user giving to various apps when they use them. And when did the policy change and what are they getting now from those users? Yeah, I, I mean, some of it is is really hard to trace, but, but you know, in, in if I was an iPhone user and I'm using maybe like uh, a Chrome or even Safari, um, you're getting a lot of background data. And like there's a lot of uh, ad companies you probably never heard of who are like serving a, a cookie on, on your, um, uh, your mobile browsing. Some of it, there, there are companies that have like invented ways to do um, deep linking between when you bounce from an app to the web, right? This is this has always been Google's fear of Apple in some ways is that Apple is uh, only you know, if your only experience on an iPhone is just moving from app to app, right? Like that is you're 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 no longer going through the turnstile of the internet, which is Google. Um, and so certainly amount of data about the, the websites you visited, how long you link, like what you click on, all, all those sort of signals. Is my understanding is like the with now that they've 
kind of fully eliminated third party cookies. And, yeah. and Google is has said they're doing the same for Chrome, uh, which is they own the, the Chrome browser. Um, it is actually this Google has pushed that timeline back several years. I think now it's they say 2024. Um, and so the idea, like basically like these third party sites that do the tracking uh, will not you effectively will not be able to know um, uh, your Internet history of like huh. what you know, if you visit golf.com and then you go to ESPN, ESPN doesn't know that you visited golf.com, right? ESPN might just sees you as a sports fan. They don't see you as like a golf fanatic. What scope do companies have to sort of bypass Apple's restrictions on this? Like, is there a lot of leeway to still somehow track people, even if they've opted out? This is, I'm not an expert, but Google and Facebook have both sort of invented these machine learning models that can like walk in backwards, right? They kind of like, like build proxies yeah, of your yeah. activity, They're building, right? Exactly. Yeah. They're, um, they both have different like jargony names for the, for the services, but effectively that's it. Like, oh, we're going to, uh, we're going to put you in a group of people. I'm going to keep going back to this golf example. We're yeah. going to put you in a group of, we don't know that, that you, Joe, are are actually visiting this, but we know that there's enough like golf fans doing this activity or using this app. And so we can approximate. I mean, the, the a real issue here is that there's Google and Facebook are, you know, have been in a duopoly in this world for a very long time. That is the, the third the actual challenger now is Amazon, right? Like certainly not a small company. Like Amazon's ads business has grown tremendously in the past few years. Uh, and they're less threatened by this because they also, it's all in-house, right? Amazon's business is based on like the activity on, on Amazon properties. Um, so that's one way that, that, that companies have got around it. The big push also that all the platforms, you see a bunch of ad tech companies have pivoted towards commerce, e-commerce, especially during the pandemic. For what it's worth, and for listeners, I don't even golf, and I don't have a pet, so I don't know why I use those <laughs> right, examples. It just seemed, no, I just you know, needed to get that out there. The ads that I've been getting on Instagram lately have been absolute garbage. The worst target in it's just Wait, unbelievable. Wait, is that true? Okay, because yeah. the ads that I've been getting on Instagram, because I, I I experimented with this because I got really interested. I was like, where are they getting this info from? Yeah. It seems to be coming in through Google. It's like if you do a Google you search, do search, it shows up yeah, on Instagram. Yeah, yeah. Or there's the one that they always have to debunk, which is like if you're talking, like right. the microphone right. thing. Which I tried companies. that too. Oh, yeah, um, my husband and I did baby carriages. We're uh, not having a baby, but just as an experiment yeah. to see like what would show up. Nothing if you talk about them in front of Alexa, but if you Google search for it, they show up on Instagram. Uh, I mean, Google has it, weird. Google for a long time we kept tried to keep. They had like a state and uh, church and state separation from like search and the rest of the display internet. Huh. And that started changing in 2015, uh, and and. Um, in part, that was just about a financial concern. Like they wanted to give more data to the ad tech industry. It was just a bigger growth. But for a long time, at least they said, and 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 people I've talked to in the early days, like have this almost religious belief that like your searches. I mean, you know, Google has our most intimate data, right? Like the things we're searching for. We tell Google things that we wouldn't tell our spouses, kind of, right? Like, uh, and, and so like that search data is incredibly valuable to a marketer if they're you know, trying and selling pharmaceuticals or lawyers, right? Like those kind of, those are the industries that typically have incredibly high uh, search ads because they're people that are really in demand for, for a, a particular thing. I, I, Instagram is, I mean, Facebook has, you know, it's so funny. People talk about how crappy the ad qualities are and yet like their ads business, you know, certainly has been s suffering because of Apple's changes, but it's still that, right, but like the, the, one of the two kings of, of the industry. Well, then talk about what we've seen specifically. So when you say, okay, they're, because this is the core of the whole thing. When we talk about their businesses has started to suffer because of the policy changes that Apple has made, what are we seeing concretely in terms of how it's spilling over? Yeah, I mean, like the dollars, I think some of this was, you know, the other fact, there are like macroeconomic factors and for marketing, there's right. the war in Ukraine and, and then there's just the, the pandemic in general. But but in part, you know, if you're an advertiser and your choices are between, say, like the television or billboard ad and, and Facebook, yeah. the argument for online has always been like, you know, the, the, there's a joke about TV. Like, I, I don't, you, know, you put your ad up there and you have no idea who's watching necessarily. And and um, that's just sort of like brand advertising, right? And, and um, in the industry, there's brand and there's direct response. And the direct response are ads are the one where you want people to make a, an immediate action. Like you want them to install an app, buy a thing. Um, this So this is, you know, Apple's changes have made it much more difficult to do that. 
Uh, and so there's, they're getting, you know, they have to be more reliant on, on brand advertising, the sort of contextual, just old But just to be clear, do we know, like, have they put a dollar amount or did yeah, they say, I you know what, this Facebook is what it would be dollar, like? Um, I, Facebook put a amount on there, actually, and I don't have it off the top of my head. Um, I mean, their market cap has taken a huge hit and some right. of it is regulation, but have they really been regulated? Yeah, like it's just, there's kind of just the, the yeah. specter of regulation. It's not like Congress hasn't gone after um, the only real big tech regulation I talk about in the book is uh, FTC went after YouTube for right. uh, illegally targeting kids with with collecting uh, data on children under 13. Um, and, and that's another area where like there's this whole online academy that's been unregulated and, and you know, you're not allowed to, to collect data on children under, thir under 13. And yet a lot of companies have done that. I mean, we don't know the numbers for YouTube in part because they don't share their financial data. Uh, but what was what was Meta's mark drop valuation drop in the past? I don't know. A, but a lot. A lot. Definitely. A lot. I'll just say this. I'm not. Let's see. Actually, the the stock went from around 360 to 160, and the market cap at the peak of 2021 was about 1.06 trillion, and now it's 400. Yeah, I mean, Facebook trillion. is. Cheap. And so, 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 so then, okay, of that roughly half a trillion dollar market cap, has anyone made an attempt to say how much can we ascribe this to? Apple and the cha that change in the online network. Facebook's business is primarily mobile advertising um, and iPhones in there was a new stat, I think recently that they're now that uh, they just leapfrogged Android in the US, it's the most popular hmm. uh, system. A Apple has historically been uh, the um, Apple phones just make, make a lot more money per user than right. Android phones do. Uh, and so we can assume that Facebook makes a lot more money on, on iPhones than on Android. And so that is a bulk of their business. And, and I think it's, you could say, like a significant impact. So you mentioned antitrust a number of times and also the sensitivity of like Google complaining about what Apple is doing, mm -hmm. given that they have a slightly different relationship with Apple than something like Meta. And also given that they're under um, antitrust scrutiny themselves. But what are the chances that we do get some sort of antitrust action when it comes to Apple and their transparency push, because it, it seems like it, it seems a little difficult. It's like on the one hand, well, you you know, you own the product, you're making it a walled garden, you're cutting people off from it. But on the other hand, you say you're doing it for privacy reasons, right? That should sound good to regulators. Right. They, they've had more Apple certainly had more uh, pressure around the, the App Store and the accusation that they're running on like an App Store monopoly or, or um, right. and that, you know, if you own an iPhone, you, you're basically like Apple is the gatekeeper. Um, and 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 I think it's digital advertising. And there's certainly companies in, in the advertising space that can complain about that. Like Apple's one movement from Cupertino has single-handedly like has huge ripple effects for this multi-billion-dollar digital advertising world. I I think that as far as I understand, Apple has faced some in Congress and uh, the Epic lawsuit. The the creators of Fortnite has sued Apple. Also sued Google, but. They've really gone after Apple um, about this is about app in-store app fees for for Fortnite games. I I think that like for for Google's case, the the most likely outcome from an antitrust might be to kneecap some of their ad tech and and like the way their digital advertising works. So what about for small businesses? That I mean, th this is the argument in favor of like hyper targeted yeah. advertising. That's like I can get it's like. Are you looking for a new dentist in the East Village yes. or teeth whitening or something yeah, like that? Yeah, they could yeah. be like hyper targeted. Like, oh my God, how do they know? I, I need a <laughs> teeth white. I'm doing video for odd lots now. I'm doing, yeah, I need yeah, teeth yeah. whitening. You hear about these complaints, but sometimes it, you can't tell if it's like AstroTurf, like some group that Facebook like may have like encouraged. Like how real is this for the companies that were able to like find a model because they're really good at like, uh, you know, finding their exact potential customers. Yeah, I'm faced with part of the, the success of Facebook and Google has been the long tail, of yeah. like the mom and pop advertisers. Uh, Facebook has leaned into this a lot as a response to Cong like Google as well. They're going to, to Amy Klobuchar's office in Congress and saying like, why are you trying to hurt small businesses, right? And like, that might be a compelling argument. Um, certainly it has political- Because like for cachet. a P&G, like everyone is going to buy laundry detergent or something, yes. right? But and so for them, I don't know if they need as hyper targeting as like yeah. I mean, the, like P and G level, they basically operate as like a they like big and they they have all these ad agencies that yeah. effectively operate as consultancies and like they are looking at spread like they're running ads with spreadsheets and algorithms and like moving the numbers around. Mm -hmm. And so yes, um, I, I think that is somewhat compelling. Um, the fact that they're 
and probably going to continue to like they know the argument that that Facebook and, and Google will make you know, despite these changes around hey, we, we lose some of our, our targeting and richness um, the audience is still here like mm -hmm. we, like relative this has been like YouTube's argument for for uh, over a decade now is like compared to television there are so many more people and so many more hours spent on YouTube and that the amount of money the marketing dollars spent on television is not proportionate. Like right. if you need, if you're like want to, if you want to challenge, and and there've been some challenger brands in uh, CPG, right? Like the challenge, the real smart challenger brands will like be where the kids are, and will be like get in front of the audience on on digital and do like sponsored content deals and and like can lean into digital advertising. That's that's effectively worked, right? Like these companies have grown because that argument has worked, and money is moving over from TV to the internet. What exactly is Apple search and advertising business? Like, there's not an Apple search engine, right? Like, what exactly are we talking about when we say Apple's really? Like, yeah, I mean, there is there's Siri, which is okay, an Apple okay. search engine in, in some ways, right? Um, there's the App Store, uh, which I think is that's where the expect. Like, if, if you look at the tea leaves on where they're hiring and putting resources, it is to run like effectively like a search advertising business mm, in the, within app, the store. app Store. Yeah, like you want to promote. Um, I don't know, like you're searching for like Uber and Lyft's like, I want to like spend right. money to be up the top result when you search for Uber and then people are going to click on Lyft. Like, right. So what's the sort of like game plan from the Facebooks of the yeah. world or the YouTubes of the world? Like what can they do to actually try to offset this? And I guess a very extreme example, but you know, could... I don't know, could Facebook like launch its own phone or something? Mm. Like if the idea is to get as close to a customer as possible. Yes. Well, this, I mean, Google has. Right. Like I'm, I got a pixel, Google pixel in front of me in part because of the company I cover and, and uh, that Google pixel, pixel was a response because like they, you know, Google has Android, the open source software model. They give away their software for free to Samsung and like a galaxy of, pun intended, a galaxy of uh, handset makers. <laughs> um, and that they like for a long time, like Google was like, okay, these will be rivals to Apple. And it hasn't really happened. And Apple, like I said, has just premium. They like people spend more money on iPhones. Yeah. And then I think Google saw in part they're investing in Pixel because they saw this world. They're like, oh, our digital advertising model is not going to last for a long time. We need to own and operate the actual hardware. I, I We reported on this quite a bit. Uh, Facebook has tried several times. I, it looks like, I mean, their company is now pivoting towards like I think Mark Zuckerberg's bet is that we're going to stick a phone in our face, <laughs> and he's going to own that, right? And like so that's there. They've renamed the company Meta. Like Facebook's existential crisis has always been that Google and Apple own the operating systems uh, where they make most of their money, and so the the move in the metaverse is Facebook will have the. Why are we even recording system. this all together in a studio? We could be Just like be, we could be legless people. avatars, legless yeah. avatars around. Uh, That's a frightening thought. Google, they, so Google and YouTube, um, and and uh, the rest of social media is is commerce, like uh, pushing commerce pretty aggressively, um, and this looks like I think more ways to purchase directly, you know, buy something directly in Instagram, for instance, um, buy something directly in a YouTube video, like. I think they're running into like the the uncanny valley of how much do you want social media to look like the home shopping network. <laughs> uh, but the, the YouTube and, and it's part of the reason I wrote this book is really fascinating. Like they built up the millions. There are about two million, over two million creators that make money on YouTube. That number is actually down from when the company had to make it a little bit harder. But that's a lot of. Uh, yeah. That's just that's a whole economy. So many of them are now comfortable because the. Uh, of, because of it's been harder and like, increasingly harder to make money and then to make now with with Apple's changes uh, higher ad rates online. So they're moving towards and you can if you watch enough YouTube, you'll like a lot of them have sponsored content deals, right? Or they're just like trying right. to sell their merch and their merchandise tip, like tabs and they're looking in the channel. I think they're they're experimenting. TikTok is also moving in commerce like that is a direct response to Apple and to privacy regulation um, cutting out carving out the like uh, the, the profitability of, of ad, online ads. So, you know, just last big picture, does it feel like this is the end of, you know, Tracy mentioned, like if, I don't remember when we did it, three or four years ago, someone came on and talked to us about the extent to which the entire internet is all ads. And does it feel like the, does this feel like a turning point? Because then, and I don't want to even like talk about 
I don't even want to say the say the word, but like Web three and this like idea of like there's going to be like something else that's like we have to like buy coins. For I'm actually Mark surprised injury. we made it like thirty. We, I know we did. Yeah, we did. No, no ads. We just like buy coins for Mark Andreessen in order to Let's use the internet. Be, like, is like, that like is that is this a turning point? Is this the, the possibility of Web three notwithstanding? Like the criticism of the Andreessens of the world is like look at this this economy we, we built around yeah. online advertising is not the world we want and like i think i'll share an anecdote from the book which is you know youtube started like a, a decade ago youtube was not making money it was it was unprofitable right. um and they had they were, they were trying to after the financial crisis they're like okay we need to make money from this thing and there was an ads manager who gave a presentation on stage about how they were going to do it and sergey bren who um this is not confirmed but sergey bren in my reporting sergey bren is a founder of google worth how much is Sergey worth? One of the world's wealthiest men, largely based on a search advertising business, made a joke about how, uh, you know, how the YouTube ads were like, he interrupted the speech being like, haha, like YouTube ads are interruptive, disruptive. And we 95.7 billion, by yeah, the way. Yeah, like the, the founders of Google have you just never- just say 100 billion at that point. <laughs> we never keep it accurate here at Bloomberg. Uh, the founders have like notoriously never loved advertising as a business model. Huh. Like it, it has clearly been successful for them. Like they will make a discrep, like a lot of them will be like search ads, search ads, you're delivering a thing that you really want. And the rest of the ads is kind of icky. And like, there's a sense, it's this weird irony in the fact that they're the biggest online advertising company and yet a lot of people that work there like don't love this it's kind of sleazy mark like people in marketing know yeah. this right i think they think of it as like old economy yes, right like ad sales absolutely true and so i web web three or whatever <laughs> like uh I, I think that you can the, the sort of case inside silicon valley is like here's a chance for us to reinvent ourselves in google's history like in the past decade they've been just trying to find a business that's not reliant on ads. Cloud computing is the, the main one. You know, YouTube has subscriptions, there's YouTube TV, uh, there, there's comment, like they've been always searching for ways to move past this, um, in part for all the reasons we talked about, and in part because they don't love it. Mm, right. Uh, and, and, but at the same time, like, you know, YouTube was once competing with Netflix, Amazon Prime, Disney, on original programming and subscriptions. They mostly dropped out. They're yeah. like, let these companies like bury themselves competing for subscribers. We're just gonna continue to dominate a, a pretty good margin heavy business, even after Apple's changes. Like on ads can remains a, a pretty successful business in Google's testing for that. Mark Bergen, congrats on the book and thank you so much for coming on the podcast. Thanks for having me. So I thought that was really interesting, Joe, and the whole transparency push by Apple was not something that was really on my radar other yeah. than I sort of like clocked it a little bit when I was using my phone, but I hadn't have thought of the impact on other businesses. But I thought it was interesting what Mark was saying about this idea that for a lot of these big tech companies, like they want to get away yeah. from the business of ad sales. And it feels like that almost from inception, like there's almost an aversion to anything to do with media from the tech companies, even though ultimately they're in the business of selling media, right? Like no one actually wants to be a content producer, right? at least YouTube <laughs> does it. Um, and when you, you know, this idea of actually having to go out and sell ads, like it does seem kind of old fashioned. It does. And I remember thinking about that too, because right, when like Google came on the scene, mm. it was like the sort of wow factor. It's like this magical money machine because you tell the computer what you're looking <laughs> for. And then that's the most amazing form of ads. But then, then a few years later, and they probably have like whole teams internally dedicated to like taking ad sales buyers from Procter and Gamble to the US Open or like right. taking them out for wine and stuff. It's like, man, this is like, this is kind of like old school. This doesn't seem very techy to me. Yeah. And I guess my other big takeaway from that conversation is we should be telling people to uh, like, comment and subscribe, right? <laughs> we should definitely be telling people to like, comment and subscribe. So please do that uh, if you're listening. You know, just one other thing, you know, it always seems, and Mark was talking about like the sort of the incredible ecosystem of ad tech companies and how there's like nine middlemen, mm. right? And it, I've always thought there's an interesting, and I asked that question about speculators, like there's seem, there, the interesting analogy between online ads and 
financial markets. Mm -hmm. Whereas you might find an edge at some point, like, oh, this ad uh, right. capacity space is really cheap here, or I found a really cheap way to get in front of these high dollar clients. And then everyone discovers it. Right. And Someone then the comes alpha into goes like away. arbitrage yeah, that really yeah. quickly. So it's like, and then the search for the new one. And so you think, why is there this like endless parade of ad tech companies? <laughs> and it's like everyone like trying to find that arb. But look, if data is going to be harder to come by, that's going to, people are going to have to really do, put in some more work. Yeah. And then the question is, what is the new edge? Because people got so into targeted advertising, like what comes next? You know, we don't talk about like tech business a lot. Maybe we should talk about because it's just there's so, you know, these companies are obviously so important in our entire for, lives. For many, many years, we haven't really had to talk about tech business because right, the share it, prices just, they went, just up. went up. They yeah. just went up. But uh, yeah, now I guess the question is, is the future is like to use the internet, we got to buy a coin from, <laughs> from Andreessen Horowitz. All right. On that happy note, shall we leave it there? Let's leave it there. Okay. This has been another episode of the Odd Lots podcast. I'm Tracy Alloway. You can follow me on Twitter at Tracy Alloway. And I'm Joe Weisenthal. You can follow me on Twitter at The Stalwart. Follow our guest on Twitter, Mark Bergen. He's at MH Bergen. And check out his new book, Like, Comment, Subscribe, Inside YouTube's Chaotic Rise to World Domination. Follow our producer, Carmen Rodriguez, at Carmen Armin, and check out all of our podcasts at Bloomberg under the handle at podcasts. Thanks for listening. <laughs>